going to be looking at the book of Genesis, chapter 33, actually chapter 34, excuse me, and I'm going to be picking up in the last few verses of chapter 33, so Genesis chapter 34, ultimately looking at the last few verses of 33 to tie us together into the context, and then moving through chapter 34, I'm going to read for our start here, chapter 34, we're going to pray, we're going to break it down, and then, Lord willing, we'll make some observations on the text given to us in Genesis chapter 35. Bible. Uh. And so I'm going to read chapter 34, and then, Lord willing, we'll be able to cover some of chapter 35. If we do that by chance, that'll be the fastest we've ever moved on Friday night, because as you know, normally we go very slow, but let's see how it lays out here this evening. Genesis chapter 34, first book of the Bible. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leda, chapter 34, verse 1, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay, her, lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her, So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah. But his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went to Jacob to speak with him. And in verse 7, the sons of Jacob had come in from the field. And as soon as they heard of it, the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, For such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Verse 11, As though Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I'll give. Ask me for a great a bride price, and I'll give it to you as a gift as you will, and I will give her whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, so that that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. And then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take our daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor, and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now... He was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of the city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them, for our, da- give them our daughters. Only on the condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised, circumcised as they were circumcised, Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they'll dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. On the third day, when they were sore, (laughs) two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brother, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with a sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I will be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Certainly a strange chapter. Let's begin in prayer. Lord, I pray as we consider the text that you would speak it to us. 
I know that this in one sense is a historical account of a very troubling occasion, but at the same time there's spiritual principle here, and there's a reason that it's recorded for us so that we can learn from it, and we can learn from their mistakes, and let us not just attack the superficial mistakes, let us look at the deeper issue that's going on. And so God, I pray that you'd give us wisdom, you give us grace, you protect us, you put your shield around us, and I pray God that the blood of Christ would cover this place. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that this word would come alive to the hearts of these men and women as each of them has a different issue, a different dilemma going on in their life. I ask that you would speak to them specifically. And God, let them know that you are God. It's not man that is clever that speaks these things. It is your Holy Spirit. So God, I would be so bold to say, speak specifically to these people address the very details of their life and i pray god in that you would receive your crown and your glory because you are the only god that is worthy to be praised so i pray god for this grace in jesus name amen well as we already said the passage itself looks a little troubling and it's in fact very troubling and you'll find later on in the book of genesis there's another chapter that's probably even more troubling but the fact is, is that it's recorded for us, nonetheless, not because it's a biography. As many biographies I read of different men that purport to be Christian men and what have you, you read their lives and you think that these men were perfect. It always shows the peaks of these men's lives, the perfection, the great things that they did, the wonders, the majesties, the miracles, and what have you. But I know for that reason and for no other reason than that, that it's not an inspired biography. And the reason it's, I know it's not inspired is because it never shows the flaws and the weaknesses of men. And when you look at a passage like this, you come to instantly, you're saying, these guys were messed up. And if you perchance have read that passage with us and you said, yeah, I get it. Well, I hate to break it to you. The Bible says that you're messed up as well. In fact, it tells us the heart of every man is deceitfully wicked above all things. It's beyond all cure. And who, in fact, can understand it? And so you read the passage not as kind of giving a justification to this perverted behavior. You read it within the greater context as a consequence of what, in fact, Jacob was not doing for and in his household. And so we're taking it into the context. We remember Jacob has been in the land of Padamaram for some 20 years. Finally, at the very beginning of his time, Padamaram, he rebelliously leaves the land. He deceives his, his father. He deceives his brother. He steals the blessing. He runs out of the land. He thinks he's going to preserve his life. He ends up losing his life. He finds himself now on the lamb for 20 years. His mother, who he loved, died out of his presence. He never saw her again. Her son, who she tried to preserve, is the very one that sent him away. Here she is trying to preserve the relationship, and she's the one that puts the suggestion into their father Isaac to send him away. And that sending away, little did she know, would mean 20 years. She would never see the boy that she loved again. And so what we found is that he was trying to help God out and get clever. And in the same way that when you and I try to help God out and get clever, we can actually bring ruin and not help to the situation. And so what we find is that he's suffering. And God put in the face of Jacob everything that he was on steroids. You know what steroids are. They make uh, your muscles bigger and stronger than what they really are. And here he was thinking he was so clever in his natural strength. I was watching a, a video last night on YouTube on anabolic steroids. And I was learning so much that I only fell asleep once. <laughs> Nonetheless, and what they're saying is that any man on steroids is going to outperform any man who is not. I remember being in high school, and there was a kid that was, went away, and he was a skinny, scrawny little kid. And he went away for one summer, and two months later, he came back with these massive pecs. They were specks, now they're pecs. And now he has these thundering guns on each of his arm, Yaquin and Boaz. Boom, the, the pillars to the temple. So you saw, you know, that, that's what steroids do. So what Jacob thought of himself is, I'm a pretty clever guy. I make life work. I'm going to trick people out of things. And God says, you know what? You sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. That's a principle of truth. And so he says, I'm going to allow you to get into your life what you've done to other men, but 50 times worse. And they came back. And he began to be deceived by Laban. Laban, he deceived his father. Jacob deceived Isaac by dressing up. Laban deceives him by marrying him to the wrong woman. I mean, which one is worse? Pretending to be your brother or getting married to a different woman? 
And now he's being tricked by the trickster of tricksters. And for 20 years, he's being ripped off. He's being lied to. And God is dealing with him until finally he brings Jacob to the point of brokenness. And he changes his name and he says, no longer are you going to be called Jacob. Why? Because what does Jacob mean? Heel catcher, supplanter, the guy that trips people up to get what it is that he wants. And he says, no longer are you going to be called Jacob, but instead you're going to be called governed by God. You've been ruled by God. You're going to be called Israel. In other words, your very nature and person is going to change. You're no longer going to be the old you. Because I'm going to impart my nature to you, we could say, to put it in the context of the new. And that new nature would now become the governing force within his life. And what we saw is this is a picture of a man being born again. He was not born again when he was in rebellion and leaving the land of promise, making bargains with God. He wasn't born again when he said, okay, God, you bless me and bless me and bless me and bless me and I'll, I'll tithe to you and do a few other things for you. But you make sure you bless me. He wasn't born again. He was still coming to God on the terms of his own renown and resource. He was still trying to be in charge of his own life. And this is why the scripture reveals to us that if a man is going to come unto the Lord, he has to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's not a verbal chant that God, like some kind of Hindu mysticism that God is, is ordaining. You know, just chant this, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's saying that this is something indicative of the relationship that you are proclaiming to have with him. That is, you are no longer the authority of your life. But you've yielded it to the Lord of heaven and earth, the God who created man, and now the creation being restored unto the creator, giving all glory unto the God who made him. And so this is the only basis. So before, before the 20 years, before being broken, he was clever, and now he's been broken, and he's no longer governed by himself. He's governed by God. He's Israel. He's declaring that you're the Lord and not me. But even within his conversion, we could say, even at the time where he finally surrendered to the Lord, and even it is with you and I, when we finally surrender to the Lord, there is going to be some rough spots. Because immediately it's one thing to say, I'm a follower of Christ. It's another thing to be put in a context where you're given the opportunity to follow Christ. It's one thing to sing songs about Jesus Christ, you are Lord. It's a different thing to actually be in a situation where you are able to demonstrate that he's the authority of your life. You know, that's why I said as Christians don't lie. We don't lie at all. We sing them all the time, but we sing lies, but we don't tell lies. And we always sing lies. Jesus Christ, you are Lord. You are Lord. You're Savior. You're God. You're almighty. I'm wonderful. I praise you. I worship you. I give you my life. Uh, you're the potter. I'm the clay. Mold me. Make me. Shape me. You know, we don't, we, we don't tell lies. We sing them like heck. And here comes this man. It means nothing to say that I'm a Christian. It means nothing to say that you're Israel until you're put into the context of being able to demonstrate whether or not that is something that you, in fact, want for your life. I mean, quite honestly, when you think of the term Christian, it means little Christ. That is, you would look at a Christian and see what Christ is like. In other words, the, the nature that is now governing the man is a different nature than what he used to be. That old nature, the old me and you, will always be in me, but it won't be my ruler anymore. There'll be another ruler over my members. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when I sin, not if, I confess my sin, not putting polluted and weird thoughts into the minds of people that know nothing about what weird thoughts I'm having, but confessing the sins in accordance with the, the fact that I've demonstrated that sin in front of you and that is not what God is like. That's what I was like. And so it's so important that I confess my sin now so that you don't confuse me and God because God isn't like that. So, so in the public context, I begin to confess my sin when in fact my sins are demonstrating in the public context that I've fallen short of the glory of God. And so this man is now being tested in what he's professing in his relationship to God. Are you really governed by God? And now he's tested in the context of his brother Esau that approaches him with 400 men. As we saw in our previous study that those 400 men were not coming out to give him a really, really nice welcome party from the lollipop guild and give this lollipop to you. They were actually coming out to kill him. He was put in a massive context. I see a little boy back there calling me dad, dad, <laughs> my son, <laughs> nonetheless. He was put within the context of these soldiers coming to attack him and to kill him. And suddenly, what do we find? Jacob finally decides not to lean upon God, but he gets clever again. Esau says, well, what are, you, what are all these people for? What, why did you do this? 
Why are you making this big display of wave upon wave of people coming to me to pacify me somehow? And he couldn't trust the grace of God, even though he spoke about the grace of God in verse 5 of chapter 33. Oh, God's been so gracious to me. He didn't believe the grace of God. And in the same regard that we can speak about the grace of God, but we don't really believe it. And the proof that we don't really believe in the grace of God is that we try to make life happen with our own resource. And the reason we try to make life happen with our own resource is because actually, sadly, we still want to be in control. In other words, we don't really want him to be Lord. But you see, when I really come to him and say, Lord, you are Lord, I really, in my active conduct in the midst of trials thus demonstrating whether or not I really believe he is Lord it's in those contexts where I need his grace but it's also in those contexts where he gives and I can demonstrate his grace if I lean not upon my own understanding but in all my ways I acknowledge the Lord and he in fact will direct my path there becomes the Christian there becomes the man yielded to this greater authority here comes the man but it's tested So at the point in chapter 32, he's born again, we could say, to put it in our context. But even though he speaks in chapter 33 of the grace of God, he's put in the context of trial and temptation, which demonstrated, Jacob, you are not yet really surrendering to Christ. We could say he's born again, but you are not acting upon the grace that has been given to you. And so God is patient with him. And the way that God is patient with him is he puts him into trial. Have you ever found this? You think, well, God, why in the world did you allow this to happen to me? Why are you letting this situation happen? It could be his grace. And you want to know why? Because God is so smart and we are so stupid. The only way that he can get our attention is to address the things in life or rather to allow us to reap what we have sown within life so that we will see, well, that's the fruit of all of my actions. And if God only rescued us, in a sense, from every stupid thing that we have ever done, we would lean upon ourselves, not acknowledging him. But he has so, in his wisdom, chosen to only rescue those who would no longer lean upon themselves, but would lean upon him. And God doesn't want us putting up these vague, blank prayers up into heaven. He wants us actually directly praying so that when he answers the prayer, he will know that it wasn't some vague generality that could have happened or didn't happen, but rather he directly addressed the situation and only glory would go unto God. God is very wise. He's very intelligent, much more smart than you or I. And so here comes this Jacob. He's tested, we found. And as soon as he's tested by Esau, Esau said, look, basically, I'm not going to kill you. I love you. Come back home, just like God told you to come back home in chapter 33 and verse 31 and verse 13. And he basically says, oh, no, 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 you go ahead of me. You go ahead and I'll meet you up later. You know, my kids and the flocks and everything, and there's nursing animals, and they'll go too slow. Well, let me leave some men with you. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to burden your men. You just go home. I'll meet you at home. Don't worry about it. I'm coming home later, babe. And then Jacob got clever again. And it says in chapter 33 and verse 17, Jacob journeyed to Succoth. And Jacob deceived himself into thinking that by saying the right things, it's the same thing as being the right person. There's many people like this. We speak the right words, but we don't live the right life. And so it was just words to him. He deceived himself. He's saying, look, I'm gonna, I'll meet you up, but he doesn't. And then it says that he journeyed to Succoth, and we found this in great detail, built himself a house, made booths for his livestock, and named the place Succoth. Now, again, in this passage, this is a full statement, and maybe we don't grasp it right offhand, but you will in a minute. Here Jacob is the first of the patriarchs, the first one that builds a house. Every single other one only built and lived in booths. It was a sign, according to Hebrews 11, that we were not part of this world. We were in tents waiting for the city who builder and maker is God. We're living upon this earth as pilgrims for a period of time. That was a picture for us so that we can now, although we do have houses today, we can know within our hearts that this is not our home. It's what Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await for a savior from there. Our hopes and our plans are not upon this earth. It's in the things of God. And that's why it says in Luke, in chapter 21, I believe, that says when the terrible things that happen upon the earth in the last days, men's hearts are going to fail them for the things happening on the earth. Why? Because their hearts are in the things of the earth. And if my heart was in the things of God and the things of this heaven, even though terrible things happen upon the earth, it doesn't lose my hope. 
I told you the truth that here we saw tonight, we, we had to pray about it, you know, those fires just a few miles away from Blue Creek. I looked at my wife, and my wife looked at me, and I'm like, well, it's not the worst thing. I said, it would be a lot of ease of financial stress if the place burns down. They praise God. I'm not stressed in the least, quite honestly. Because I saw how he preserved my house in an instant. And if that place wants to burn down, God, let it burn. Burn it down the house. <laughs> Go for it, Lord. Why? Because my hope is not Blue Creek. You know, we sing that song, My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. Again, we're lying. If it's not true. Oh, yeah, God, my hope is in you. Oh, my house. My hope is in you. Oh, she left me, Lord. My hope is in you. Oh, my job. So, God puts him in this context of pain and difficulty, but Jacob is ever clever. Jacob, knowing that his father and everyone else before him have never lived in the things, Jacob, he was supposed to go back to the place where God had met him. He was supposed to go back to Bethel, but he gets reasonable again because there's always a reasonable alternative to walking by faith. He gets reasonable again and decides not to do what God told him to do because he's afraid of Esau. He allows fear to motivate him, not faith. And he goes the other direction. He goes towards Shechem. He goes there, but he calls it Sukkoth. Why does he call it Sukkoth? What does Sukkoth mean? It means booths. Do you see the contradiction now? So here's the man that tells himself that he's living by faith by calling the place a place of faith Sukkoth. It's a place of booths. It's a place of tents. But then he acts out the ways of this world. He says, I'm going to build myself a house. The last man that built himself a house was Lot. And how wonderful did that turn out? Be careful when you start falling away from the Lord and looking to <clears throat> by building lots. And so here he is, turning away from God, but deceiving himself by saying the right things, by having the right words, by saying, but we'll call the place Sukkoth. We'll call it by a godly name. We'll, we'll say that we're walking by faith. We'll say we're living in tents, but I'm going to build my foundations deep and firm upon the earth. And so again, Jacob is walking in rebellion. And Jacob, it says in verse 18, came safely to the city of Shechem. As soon as you decide to walk in the ways of the world, it won't oppose you. You can come safely. The world will receive you by a warm arm. And he comes safely. And sometimes when people think about the direction that God has for their life, they say, well, what does God want me to do? Do want me to go left or does he want me to go right? So many people make the decision based upon, well, if I go left, it's, it's safe, it's easy, it's right. And if I go right, it's hard and it's difficult. Well, God wouldn't want me to go the hard and difficult route. Of course he wouldn't. He must be God's direction to lead me down the safe and the easy path. And for you, I would reference only Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus said, the broad road leads to destruction, and most people go down it. But the narrow way, look at the Greek word, the constricting, the tight, the painful, the harsh way, is the way that leads to life, and few people find it. So what is the basis of me making decisions? God, what do you want me to do? Or which path is easier? What's the basis of deciding what way I'm going to go? What's, what's the easiest way? You know the old phrase, any old dead fish can float downstream? It takes a strong one to fight against it. God, give me your life. Let me show that I actually have life. Let me not just go with the current and the rage and the rave of the day. Let me go the path that you've called me to. And if it's tight, constricting, if it means I have to go up waterfalls and jump between the teeth of bears, then let me go up there. But Lord, don't let me go down the path of all men. Because the way to spawning life, you could say, to keep the figure going, the way to abundant life being populating the streams of life, we could say spiritually, is not to go with the dead fish and float down. It's actually to go to the place of danger and risk. And so here comes Jacob. He's deceiving himself. But in his deception, suddenly life gets easy. In his deceptions, all of a sudden the problems go away. And little does he know that his daughter is now being made vulnerable in the spiritual things to be devoured by this man named Shechem. Well, he's so convinced in himself that he's walking the way of God. He's so convinced that he's doing because he says the right words. But he doesn't have the right action. He's in the wrong place, building a house and deceiving himself by calling it a place of booths. We, we're exactly the same. And he's exposing himself and he believes that he's walking the path of God because everything's good. As soon as I made this decision, it's gone easy. The pressure's off. 
And you know, there's a passage in the book of Genesis that tells us in dealing with Noah, it says, I will only strive with men for another 120 years. Now, when you read a passage like that, do you hear God's grace or do you hear God's being a big, fat meanie? I hear God's grace. Because any time that God is opposing a person and striving against them, this is his conduct towards man because God gives warnings as intermittent periods of his grace. God gives a warning after a warning. He speaks, but the problem is if men don't heed the voice of God, they harden their own heart. It's like it's calloused. It no longer feels anymore. And suddenly now what was the sensitive, pure, and the clean touch of God now becomes hard and calloused. And calluses are the way that we keep ourselves alleviating from pain. And if our whole purpose in life is to avoid pain, we'll, we'll actually invite the callousness. Oh, he can never do that to me again. I've calloused my heart. Oh, she can never say these things. I've made my heart hard. And yet the scripture reveals that we're to have soft hearts. Friend, I'll tell you the truth. The only way that you're going to be vulnerable like that is to understand your identity in Christ, that he'll protect you. And then the only reasoning that follows is not just to avoid pain, it's to only do what God would tell me to do, to only be where God called me to be. So Jacob is a picture of a believer that wants to live a God-fearing life, but he wants to live a God-fearing life in the place where he is chosen. Do you understand that? It's in the way that he is chosen. And here he comes safely into the arms of Shechem. Oh, but it's so easy. Everything's lining up. Life is good. It's got to be God. Why? Because it's so easy. It's fun. I'm at peace. And little does he know that the decisions that we make have consequences. Little did he remember that one decision he made 20 years before led to 20 years of heartache and pain. And so many young people today don't believe that one decision that you make will affect your life for 20 years. They don't believe this. But talk to anybody. Just don't go to the Bible. Go to the Bible, but talk to anybody. One decision can ruin your life. I know young people that make decisions, and they have very stupid and foolish decisions. For the rest of their life, they'll be thrown at jail, whatever. And I think they're so wise. And here he makes another major decision. He's rebelling against what God told him to do. He's living where he wants, doing what he wants, when he wants, and he thinks his life is his own. Hey, friend, I hate to tell it to you, but... Here's the one thing you need to weigh before you come to Christ. When you come to Christ, you're saying, I don't make the choices anymore. You do. It doesn't mean the pastor makes the choices. I'm not saying that at least. It doesn't make the church. No, it means, Lord, you make the choices, not me. It means that I don't say, well, I'm going to go left because it's the easy path. No, go right. But that's hard, Lord. Well, I'm not a masochist, but I'm telling you the truth that the left path is actually a deceptive trap. You see, they put in the broad, clear places is where the traps are set because they know that most people are going to walk them. But I have this tight, narrow path that there's no traps, but you can't stray from the path. But here comes the safety, Shechem. Here comes the, the danger that he's exposing his daughter to. And he's not even aware of it. And the reason he's not aware of it is because he deceives himself deception the nature of deception is you believe that what you're believing is true but in fact it's false right wouldn't that be deception nobody walks around and says you know i'm being deceived right now the bible says that our hearts are deceitfully, deceitfully wicked above all things the bible tells us that our hearts actually deceive us in other words the bible tells us that we actually believe the stupid things that come into our head and we think that they're god because we thought them You know what wisdom does? It goes back to the word of God. Wisdom doesn't make decisions based upon circumstances because if you make decisions based on circumstances, the devil will lead you into Shechem every time. But if you make as many are led by the spirit of God, and so many people don't know how to tell the difference between the spirit of God and circumstances. I'm not saying God can't use circumstances, but look at the fruit of any action and tell me whether it's God. Very simple test for me is, Will this thing that I'm doing cause me to be more sanctified or less? The decision and the route that I'm turning, is it causing me to grow closer to the Lord or is it risking me to fall away from him? And based upon that alone, I make decisions. And guess what? In all my ways, I acknowledge the Lord and he, in fact, directs my path. 
At the very least, I look at the word of God and I say, God. The secondly, I go to godly men and women. Godly, not just everybody that says they're a Christian. There's plenty of people that say they're a Christian, just like Jacob, and they're not wise. They're stupid. They still live according to sensual wisdom. So don't just go to a person that says they're a Christian. Go to a person you've seen them live the Christian life. You've seen them make the hard choices. You've seen them walk with godliness and integrity and purity. You see that there's a holiness in the way that they look at the younger sisters in Christ. Go to them. Don't go to the guy that's looking at the girls and sisters in Christ and like, hey, you know. There's something beautiful when we want to cover the ladies. There's something deceptive and destructive in our hearts, in every man's heart in this room, sadly, that wants to uncover. But it's by the Spirit of Jesus Christ that says, I want to cover them. I want them to be pure. I want them to be separate. I want, I want to look upon them with absolute purity. Go to men like that. But don't go around looking for advice that will tell you exactly what you want to hear because if you only commit yourself to what you want to believe, what you like in the scripture, if you only commit yourself to the, the doctrines that you like, it's not the doctrines that you believe, it's only yourself. Commit yourself to Christ. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And so what happens is waiting for them is a destruction, a terror. And God is warning, undoubtedly. God finally gets his attention at the end. He tells them in chapter 35 and verse 1, Arise, go to Bethel and dwell there. He has to, before he can say chapter 35 verse 1, before he can make this declaration, life has to get really, really, really hard for him. And the way he gets his attention is by allowing him to reap what he has sown. And so there she is. The first thing that we see within the passage that we already read is that Dinah, his daughter, is like a foolish girl. There's a passage, I think it was Brother Zach Poonin was pointing it out. He was saying that there's a passage in the Song of Solomon that it talks about our younger sister is like a a wall. And then he talks about there's the other girls that are like a door. Now, think about this. Which one are we? Are we like a wall? How hard is it to access a wall? Pretty difficult. How hard is it to access a door? (laughs) And they said about one girl, she's like a door. What do you mean? Well, everyone gets a turn. (laughs) What are we? Are we like a wall? Are we like a door? Do we allow anyone to come in? Anyone to enter? Or do we say, no, I'm reserved. Here's this girl. She's following her rebellion of her father. Now she's living out the rebellion she sees in her father, whether she consciously recognizes it or not, but she's living it out within the context of the world that she's in. She flirts and runs around into a city by herself, endangering herself into the arms of Shechem. She thinks she's confident. She she has a a strength within her. You say, well, where does it say that? It has to be that. If she was fearful and timid, she wouldn't have gone anywhere. I'm not saying fearful and timidity is the answer. What I'm saying is that she's walking in this this confidence that is a completely false confidence. Have you seen girls like this? They go out and they expose themselves to situations. They're so confident that they, it could never happen to me. They, they think that it's you know, prudish to, to say, well, don't talk to him and don't, don't put those body parts out there. They think it's prudish to talk like that. Let me tell you the truth. There's wisdom. Because men will actually harm you. I don't think I need to recall stories. The fact is, is that life is dangerous. And she doesn't think so. She goes out and flits and floats into the city of Shechem with complete confidence. But then it tells us in verses 2 and 3 a very interesting thing. Something that at first first appearance, it tells us in verse 2 that he raped her, number 1. And number 2, in verse 3, it says, then he loved her. His soul, it says, was drawn to Dinah, his daughter, to uh, to Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, and said, Give me this girl for my wife. And I sit back and say, This does not make sense. This does not flow with all of Scripture. In all of Scripture, what it shows us, for instance, remember David's son who raped his half-sister? It was lust that was motivating him towards her, not love. And when he got what he wanted from her, it says that he hated her more than he loved her. That's the tone of Scripture. The tone of Scripture everywhere is that when you enter into a relationship based upon raw lust, you get what you want, and when you're done, you're like, woman, you're disgusting. 
Let me go find something else. That's the reality of life. That's what scripture reveals. Yet here in this passage, it tells us that he rapes her, verse 2, and when Shechem saw the son of, ha- the son of Hamor, the, Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her, laid her, lay with her, and humiliated her. And then as we just read in verses 3 and 4, it talks about him loving her and saying, please bring her to me. What is the deal behind this radical kind of uh, Uh, behavior that is completely opposite of what we see in nature, completely opposite of what we see in men in general. Well, I think something more evil is going on. You remember Saul in the scripture. It tells us an evil spirit would come upon him. David was playing the harp, singing music, and it would calm him down. And as he's playing the music, his heart would calm down. One time he gets so angry, furious, he picks up a spear and throws it into the wall. The guy was demon-possessed. In a day and age when people don't think that stuff is real, it's real. And guess what? He stuck that spear into the wall. What was the wall? Sheetrock with two by fours? No, plaster with stone. How much force and strength did Saul have? Well, you could probably say it was otherworldly. Remember the man of the Gadarenes in Mark chapter 5? They would put shackles on him, he'd break them off. I mean, there's this ungodly, unnatural strength inside of Saul. He's raging with anger. And in the next moment, he's saying some of the most beautiful things on earth. What is going on with this man? He violently rapes a woman. He humiliates her. And then he loves her. I think of C.S. Lewis's uh, The Silver Chair. And in The Silver Chair, it shows the man. Have you seen the show? It's a great show, if you understand what he's trying to say in the picture form. The guy that's in the chair is demon-possessed, long story short. And he's got a mask on him. And when he goes crazy is actually the time that he's sane, because he's saying, get me out of the chair. When he's possessed by this evil spirit, he submits to the green witch in this case, which was the white witch in the previous novel. The devil, in other words. He submits to her. And she has dominion over her. But then when he comes to his senses, he freaks out and says, get me out of her dominion. It was Ray who told me a while back, he says, you know, before I came to the Lord, that's the way I was. He goes, and if you know anything about Ray's background, you know that he had, his, it was bad. I'll just put it that way. And his family, it was, you know, he beats all of you. Yep. I mean, together, all of you together <laughs> in one. So when you sit back and you think, yeah, that was bad. That was really bad. And he says, but God still gave me moments of sanity. And he goes, when I watched that movie, it made complete sense because there would be times where I had such clarity of thought. I could see it and I'd say, this is truth. And then he says, I would rebel against it and I would go back to that insanity. And those moments of sanity got less and less and less. In other words, I was hardening my heart against it. Be careful because when God speaks, he speaks for a reason. And I've seen so many men, so many women harden their hearts against the voice of God. And what was the problem in the silver chair? The problem was, is that there was two natures. He was possessed by one, being led by an evil spirit, and he wanted to do his own thing. God isn't into possessing people in the sense that he dominates your flesh. He's in liberating people so that a man can be what he was intended to be upon the earth. Satan is about ruining people. God is liberating men to be men before him. But there's only one Lord, not you. You try to make yourself the Lord, you'll come under the bondage of Satan. Genesis 3. You make him the Lord, God will set you free. It's the lie of Satan that says, you try to be God and you'll become you know, master. You try to be God and you'll become under Satan's kingdom. And so what's going on with this dichotomous nature? You know what dichotomy means? It means it's kind of like a fork in a road. It has two branchings off. What is the explanation for the dichotomy that we see here? I think one thing. I think the man was possessed doesn't say that in the passage. But if you go back to our previous study in Genesis in chapter 12, when it talked and introduced for the first time Shechem, what we saw in those passages is Shechem was strength. He tells that he has a great abundance. Ask any bride price you want for me. He has an abundance of wealth. He has abundance of power. In other words, Shechem represented great strength and power. And he always represents it in a way, as if you go back to our Genesis 12 passage, in a way that appears to be godly. That strength and that power from God. This is God doing it. 
How do you know? Shechem's there. Strength. That man, that power is there. But one problem, look at the fruit. He raped her. Look at the fruit. He violated her. He humiliated her. And then he speaks tenderly to you? Are you kidding? Look at the fruit. And she undoubtedly felt so ashamed, she was willing to go along with it. It doesn't say that in the text either, but it's only my mind. And so why do you explain these two natures coming out? I think this is something evil going on behind the scene. That's the only thing that explains why this uh, thing that has puzzled many scholars, the only thing that makes sense is when it makes no sense, there's something else going above and beyond the sense that we're used to. And so what does Jacob do? He does nothing. He hears about it and he doesn't do anything. Why did she fall into trouble? I'll tell you the truth. Nine times out of ten when a daughter falls into trouble, I'll tell you who to blame. Her dad. (laughs) Why? Because we're wimps. We didn't play the role that God called us to play. We didn't protect her. The second person to blame is usually the mother. The mother can sometimes be guilty of teaching their daughters their old wiles and ways. The third person I see to blame is the daughter. And when she finally, he finally finds out what happened to her, he does nothing, but he waits for his sons to come in, his sons who are working, and he waits for them to come. How pathetic. He's such a wuss, not enough of a man that he actually can say, this is wrong, I'm going to deal with it. But instead, out of his own fear, he sets up his sons that are supposed to be kids. Let them be kids when they're supposed to be kids. But because dad is not playing his role, the kids feel unempowered, so they take the power and they tarry it in a place very unwisely that should not have been done. They kill a bunch of people in response to this. Not good. But it all starts because dad isn't playing his role. So get back to a rich, and dad isn't playing his role because he's walking in rebellion. He's not where God told him to be. He's somewhere else. He's not doing what God told him to do. He's doing something else. Then we find that he's powerless now to deal with the very evil thing done to his family. (laughs) Fathers, your job is to protect your little girl. Your job is to look at them and say, I need to make sure. I need to guard them and cover them. They'll hit a point where they don't want that covering. Hopefully they'll marry somebody and then he can be a covering for her, hopefully, to protect her, not to domineer, not browbeating. But there is to be a guarding and a protecting of our little girls. And so Jacob does nothing. And this is consistent with the man that is no longer walking in the authority of God. You know, the scriptures say in the Psalms that the righteous are as bold as what? A lion. Do you really think that, could you picture a righteous man coming in like a cat? Meow. In our neighborhood, someone has had rabbits, and they got out. And this morning, we have multiple rabbits and a wild jackrabbit. As far as I can tell, it looks like a jackrabbit with the great big ears. I don't know. Help me here. I don't know. It it doesn't look like a domesticated rabbit hanging out with the other rabbits. You know how guys do this as well, right? When we were in junior high, we used to say, ooh, exotic women, women from other schools, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? And then you got into college, and you're like, ooh, exotic women, women from, you know, Russia or something like this. You know, it's always somewhere else. It's like, ooh, exotic, you know. I saw it with the rabbits this morning, a little jackrabbit jumping around saying, ooh, exotic rabbits, <laughs> rabbits from kennels, <laughs> you know, type of thing. <laughs> they were talking and sniffing each other and eating pieces of grass. It was really romantic. But I'm not too scared of those rabbits. Could you imagine that? The righteous are as bold as a rabbit. That's what I hear today. I hear the righteous are as bold as a fluffy bunny. Wait till I slap you up and down your face this morning with my sermon with my soft kitten paws. (laughs) Now don't you ever do that again. Kaboosh. Kaboosh. I'm hitting you with pain. Kaboosh. It's not going to scare anybody. And next week, come back again, and I'll slap you with my tail. A caboose. You come to a Bible teaching church here, 
And if you don't be careful, our worship leader, the bunny, is going to rip your little fungus off your toe. But it'll help you. I don't think so. And so the scripture reveals to us the righteous are as bold as a lion. So when you look at this man, and he's insecure and weak, and his daughter was just raped, he does nothing. He's not doing what God told him to do. He's not walking where God told him to walk. He has emasculated himself. He doesn't need a woman to do that, which is the rave of the day. He doesn't need a woman to do it for him. But rather, he does nothing, and his sons become angry. His sons, or it says there in verse 7, are indignant and very angry because they have done this thing to our sister. What is the temptation that follows? Be at peace. (laughs) <laughs> the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 that we're not to be unequally yoked. And you know what that means? It not only means in the context of our day that a, a blue one's not supposed to be with a blue one and a pink one's not supposed to be with a pink one, but it also means there in 1 Corinthians 6 that a follower of Jesus Christ should not knowingly marry a person that is not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I personally don't believe in missionary dating. I know that certain people it's worked with in the past – but I don't believe in it. It harms more people than helps. It has helped some, but rarely. But the basis of the relationship is that, Lord, I'm going to seek you, and I'm going to trust that if I put you first, you'll pull someone to me. But I'm also going to trust that if I seek people, I'll find the wrong person. So I'm just going to allow you to choose, because your word says in Matthew 19, what God has put together. And so, Lord, I'm going to believe that you, the sovereign God of this universe, can literally bring a help meet into my life that will be the perfect choice for us together to honor you with our bodies, our minds, and our souls, and our spirits. God, I'm going to trust you for this. You keep your eyes on the Lord. He'll pull you together. You put your eyes on each other, you'll keep him out of the equation. He's the divine magnet. And so... Here in this passage, that Hamor comes with Shechem, who just raped the daughter. He comes and says, hey, look, let's be at peace. Paul the apostle has something to say about that. Don't be unequally yoked. Well, come on. I mean, we've already crossed the lines. We've already gone too far. So let's just go ahead and go further. Let's get married. Sometimes young girls come to me and they say, well, you know, I had a, a, a child with him. So let's just go ahead and get married. Or we got pregnant. So let's just get married. You know what I say? No. <laughs> Run. Don't get married. Your father would probably raise the child much better than a horny husband. So, no. You know, well, it's bad, so let's make it worse. No. And now he begins to woo him, and he says, but listen, look, we'll become people, we'll intermarry with all of our people. You know, the pagan people and the people they're supposed to, and not very well, walking with the Lord. The people that are the pagan people of the world that are lost in darkness and the people that are supposed to, though they don't seem to be very well, uh, walking in Christ. And instead, the compromise comes in as well. You've blown it really bad. You know, Satan tripped you up into sin, so you might as well just go full head into it and completely intermarry, completely do the thing, and make sure that you spiritually attach yourself to the pagan world around you. You know, it's no wonder why they were attracted to it, because it tells us in chapter 35 that when God finally came to Jacob, God told him, Leave your place that you're in, go to Bethel. And then Jacob understood what that meant because he took, looked to his family finally for the first time as a man and said, guess what? Leave your idols behind you. In other words, his whole household was full of these false gods. Huh. But in the meantime, the temptation is coming. Israel, governed by God in name only, Jacob is still being Jacob. He has no power. He's trying to work the situation. At least he's not being a Weasley, but he's doing nothing now. And his sons are trying to take control. The temptation comes. Intermarry. Go deeper. We can get property. In other words, it's going to be a good deal. Violate what God has said in his word because it can be advantageous to our business. We can get all this. Just, just do it. You'll get property, verse 10 says. And then Shechem comes in. And here he is, the man who's strong, who offers a great deal of beauty. What do you think the guy looked like? He had no teeth. You know, he had runny nose, pus coming out of his eyes, and had dirty clothes. What do you think his dad looked like? Do you think this very, very powerful man went out and found the, you know, the ugliest jackrabbit she could find and marry him? No. I'm thinking powerful men marry beautiful women. 
And the fact is, is that beautiful women and beautiful men have beautiful children. I think Shechem was very good looking. I think he was very clean and presentable. I think he spoke well. Clearly, he has intelligence when we read verses 11 and 12. And here they come presenting, saying, look, if I found favor in your eyes, are you kidding me? Ask for me a great bride price. In other words, you ask for anything and I'll give it. That's how serious I am about this. He'll make you follow Shechem. He'll make your path easy. He'll tempt you. He'll violate you and make you feel dirty and tempt you to just jump back into the old ways completely. But then he comes and he says, but listen, I will give you abundance. I will give you anything you ask. And it was Jacob's place to stand up and say, no. So his sons took his place and did it bad because they're not supposed to be doing it. They did right and they said no. But they said no in a very deceptive way. It says, okay, we already read it. I don't need to read it again. I'll summarize. Okay, we'll say yes. <laughs> we're not going to say yes, but sure, we'll say yes. You see, we're a circumcised group of men. It was a sign of a covenant, Genesis chapter 17. Maybe you heard of our father, Abraham, <laughs> 17, 17 pairs of scissors. And so he came in, and we, we <clears throat> circumcised all the men, uh, uh, young men in the, in the whole tribe. It was a sign that was going to be that there's a cutting away of the flesh. By the way, it wasn't until Abraham got circumcised that he could actually produce Isaac. It was going to be supernatural. Before he was circumcised, he produced Ishmael. When you're still in your flesh, you produced Ishmael. When he was walking in the spirit, the supernatural gift that is beyond his ability, when you cut away the flesh, he produced Isaac. But it wasn't him producing it. It was God within him. The whole picture is we talked about that. But now they give the appearance that they're after spiritual things for the welfare of these people that purportedly they're going to intermarry with. Okay, we'll let you marry into our family. <laughs> but first, you've got to become like us. Well, what are you guys like? Huh. Well, we're circumcised. Now, if you don't know what that is, wives, ask your husbands when you go home tonight. Don't look it up on the internet, <laughs> but just, just trust me on that one. And if you're just like, I still don't get it, nah, just wait till you get married. So they said, you become as we are. And they said, listen, if this is what it's going to take to get married to that woman, I'll do anything. Look what it says in verse 18. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. You know what Shechem is a picture of? He's a picture of a young man that will do anything in order to get a girl. He'll come into a religious context and do anything as long as I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, and where I want. But in the minor issues of life, I'll completely surrender anything. Major issues, no, 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 no. But I'll do anything. I bet you if they said, Shechem, we want you to cut off your left leg, I bet you Shechem would have done it because he loved the girl so much. Don't be a fool. Don't be deceived because you see somebody saying, oh, I'm seeking the Lord, I'm serving him, I'm walking. Yes, 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 I'll do anything. But you know what that kind of a man does? Ultimately, ultimately he seizes the girl he lays with her and he humiliates her because he's doing what he wants, when he wants, where he wants. He makes his decisions. He deceives himself saying, oh, I'm walking by faith, suck off, but actually I'm building a house. He'll get what he wants and everybody will be deceived. And so they say to him, listen, you cut off a part of your anatomy. Which part? That part? Uh-huh. Okay. Because I want her. He will do anything to get because he delighted in a young girl. And he was the most honored of his father's house. That didn't help his humility, did it? If you were to go to his family and say, well, well, what do you think about your son? He's my best kid. He's upright. He does great. He's my, he is just honored in our family. He is the best of all my kids. That's who you're looking at right there. And it says their words pleased him. And so Hamor and his son Shechem gathered together at the city gate. And they said, now we've got to convince the people in the city. And they go to them. And they say, listen, we can intermarry with them. They're going to give us our daughters, their daughters, and everything else. One thing, we've got to get circumcised. What's circumcised? 
Does anybody have Google Maps? <laughs> you know, or like, so I'll show you some pictures here. Not maps, but images. <laughs> and then he said in verse 23, Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Interesting. In the agreement, in verses 8 to 12, it was that we would share all things. But what was Shechem really after? In the secret place with his own people, he says, but really, it'll all be ours. You know what the reality is? When you intermarry, when you give in to somebody just because they give an outward appearance of surrendering to the authority of the one God. When God speaks, it's not a suggestion. I know somebody, someone really follows the Lord because when he speaks, he obeys him. But they'll do anything apart from obedience in the important areas. Anything. I'll cut off my leg. Cut off anything. If I can get the girl. But if we give in, you know what happens? Everything will be theirs. Everything will be lost. Everything. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Come on, guys, just do it. I know it sounds terrible. Let's do it. Do you know how much advantage is going to come into our lives if we pretend to be Christians? Huge! Now, no man says that because we all think we're better than we are. No man. But you know what? I don't believe people are Christians because they tell me. Most people do. They say, I'm a Christian. Oh, well, we're all Christians. In this country, at least. I don't believe people because they say they're Christians. I watch them. That's all. God told me to do this. Okay, do it. No. You're not under his lordship. Well, I'm a Christian. No, you're, you're in name only. But you haven't yet surrendered yourself, Jacob, to be Israel. You're still Jacob. You're not Israel. You're still acting in a way. And here's Shechem, because Jacob is not playing his part. Once again, a man comes into their life that plays the part of what Jacob's doing. He's using manipulation, lying, cheating. And what is the thing you fear the most is going to happen to you? So much better to obey our Lord. And it tells us on the third day when they were sore. (laughs) How long does it take to heal? On the third day while they were still sore, Simeon and Levi came in and wiped them out. Later on, Jacob curses them. He says, because of your anger, you're as unstable as the seas. But Jacob should have looked at himself and said, I'm a coward. I'm a coward. Because I put my boys in that place where they felt unempowered, so they took power. And when young boys take power and don't have the wisdom how to wield the sword yet, they end up cutting up people they shouldn't cut up. Know that. You're not going to play the part of the man in your house? Your young boys are going to look at you and be frustrated because you're not playing the role God told you to play, and they'll take the sword, and they'll cause so much damage to people that should not be cut. And they take the sword. And who was Levi? Levi was the religious one. He was the one from whom his family would be the priests. Many years later, hundreds of years later, Levi. What a picture. The young, immature, not matured priest yet. He's not old enough to be his own pastor, we could say. He has religious zeal sees the failure of the men that are over him. So he tries to take control and to make a bad situation right, but he does it wrong. He just ruins people, but at least he's trying to do something. And it all could have been settled if Jacob just would have done what he was supposed to do, follow God, do what God told you to do. But instead, the very people you love the most end up getting damaged. He was trying to preserve them. They got lost. And then what is Jacob concerned about? Look what he says in verse 30. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Nothing about you just killed a bunch of men. Nothing about you did a very evil thing. You say, well, the scripture says that, you know, they're supposed to wipe them out. 400 and some years later, when they became wicked and evil, not yet. He doesn't even care. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against and attack me, against me and attack me, notice the me, 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 sounds like Beaker, doesn't he? Me, 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 me. I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. 
But they said, should he treat our sisters like a prostitute? You know, I'm not going to go any further. It ties in marvelously if we had time to get into it. But let me only say a couple of things. Look what he said again. I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. Jacob, in fact, your household is being destroyed. The thing that you're fearing the most has happened to you because you're not walking in what God told you to do. There's a sense that if we don't walk by faith, the fear will have dominion over us. I'm going to be destroyed. Dude, it started already. It's already happening. And that's why, as we already said in chapter 35, he says, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. What was the motivating factor to get him to finally move? Pain. And God got his attention. So he boldly, I can do what I want. I've arrived. I've wrestled with God. I prevailed. God put his name and nature in me. Glory. I'm going to go out and do my own thing and walk the way I want, go where I want. Yep, I'm going to do it. Yep. And he makes a mess of it. And God actually comes to him again and says, okay, never mind. Do something different. No, God doesn't do that. You just waste time if you're in Christ. You waste time. He comes back to you when you get your senses and go through your whole circle of pain. And he says, now go back and do what I told you to do before. That was 20 years ago. Yep. Because I don't change. But that was a long time. I don't pick up where you, I pick up where you left off. That's where we're going back. There's people that are so much younger than me in the Lord. Dude, you're not progressing one inch along the trail. You're just circling the same spot on the trail in, in figure eight all the way around the trail. And you think you're progressing in your walk with the Lord, but you're doing figure eights on the trail while those people 20 years ago are 20 years ahead of you. You're not in the same place as them. They're miles away from you. And you guys email once in a while and say, yeah, I've really grown in the Lord. You're doing figure eights on the same spot on the trail. You're not moving anywhere. So go back to the central point of that trail where the figure eights cross and start moving a new direction. Move forward. My household is being destroyed. No, Jacob. It's not because of what your sons did. Your sons did what they did because you didn't do what God had told you to do. And when he finally reacts, he tells them to get rid of their gods and their household. They're worshiping pagan gods and they're supposed to be worshiping the Lord. Hello. Hello. How passive is he in this household? And ultimately, the chapter closes, and we'll see this next time. His mother dies, but also Rachel dies. The very woman that he loved at the beginning, the one who is hoodwinked around, she was delivering their child, Benjamin. She died. And when she died, Jacob is still Jacob. He's still scheming. It says in verse 20 of chapter 35, Jacob sets us a pillar over her tomb. It's a pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. And then verse 21, Israel journeyed on. What was it going to take for Jacob to stop being Jacob? His daughter's defiled. He goes through pain of having to make hard decisions for his household. And finally, his wife, who he so, so, so loved, she died. And when she died, finally, it was the coup de grace to Jacob, or at least a deeper death for Jacob. And Jacob finally died. He says, okay, Lord. And sometimes God has to bring us to a point of a death of something dearly, dearly loved. I mean, Rachel's fine. She went to be with the Lord. That's no big deal with her. But you've lost her for time. And she died. But Jacob died as well. And he got up as Israel. And he journeyed on. And pray, Lord, that you would continue to witness this word to our hearts. I pray, God, that even as at the beginning we ask together that you would speak very prophetically that each man and woman, boy and girl will think that I was talking directly to them and God I wasn't speaking directly to a single person you have conversations with men 
I pray, God, in Jesus' name, you would win out with these people and they would not resist you, but yield. We pray this by your grace. We need it. We pray for your mercy. We pray, God, for the will we choose to follow you, to act towards you. Let us avoid the tragedies in the life of Jacob. So sad.